math and science teachers that don't suck. Our videos are super comprehensive and searchable, so you'll get answers, not waste time. All right. Well, um, we're a couple minutes away from viewing time here, and uh, we're going to be talking about the Reformation. So, just waiting for a few people to come online and see if we uh, get some interest in this week's live tutoring session. All right, looks like we've got some people starting to come on here. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here, um, talking about the Reformation and uh, hopefully answering some questions that you may have about it. But uh, wait for a few more people to come online and, uh, and then we'll get going. All right, we got some more people starting to show up here. So hi there, everybody. We'll start in just a couple of minutes. And, and uh, questions you have about the Reformation, and uh, maybe tell a few stories here and there. Um, so uh, yeah, I think if you have any questions, there's a chat window where you can have your, where you can post your questions. I'll try and answer them as best I can, and uh, get going. All right, William, I'll get with your question in just a couple minutes, so uh, hang on there. I'm glad you guys are watching uh, my videos in class. That's kind of uh, kind of neat, kind of freaky on this end, to be honest with you. Think about that. I hope you're enjoying them, I suppose. But yeah, we got a few more people coming on. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll just sort of get started. <sighs> All right, well. Um, I guess we might as well go ahead and get things rolling. So my name is Paul Sargent, and uh, this is a little bit of live tutoring. Today we're going to focus on the Reformation, but inevitably people will come up with questions about other things as well. So feel free to ask any questions you might have about, you know, whatever it is you're studying in Euro class. And, uh, you know, so the first thing I want to say when you talk about the Reformation is understand that the Reformation is more than sort of a discussion about religion. I mean, religion, of course, is at the heart of it, but just like anything else, the Reformation has multiple, multiple stories and multiple, multiple um, causalities going on. It's, it's a pretty complicated time. So um, as we go through this, you know, it, I hope it doesn't sound at any time like I'm trying to favor one religion or anything like that because I'm not. Um, but uh, it's sort of the nature when you talk about the Reformation. 
talk religion and go through there. And hi, Charity. Nice to see you. All right, so uh, we'll start off here. William has a question about uh, elaborating on humanism within the Renaissance. Well, actually, it's a good place to start because the humanist movement is sort of also sparks the Reformation. Humanism is sort of this, this revival of the learning of the ancient world. Um, and really, historians like to divide it into two different parts. You've got the Italian uh, humanist movement, and you've got the Northern humanist movement. Um, and, uh, and really, like they're both focused on the same things. You go back and you look at old uh, texts, you learn the ancient languages of Greek and, and uh, Latin, you become very good at them, and then you use those texts to re-examine what's going on around you. Um, inside of Italy, this is largely used to kind of put a more secular or humanistic, I guess, uh, view of the world in front of everybody. So you kind of look around and you say, hey, you know, this is in the Middle Ages where everybody, where everything is all about, um, you know, Catholicism and getting into heaven and all of that. There's value in the individual as well. There's value in just sort of being a human and studying what makes humans special. And it's okay to make yourself better and to make your society better and all of that. And maybe if we look at some ideas from some of these ancient writers, especially Plato becomes like a really big writer, but Cicero and, and, and other writers, um, if we look at their, their um, writings, which are now starting to sort of pop up everywhere, well, then maybe we can find some old ideas about how to live life that could be, you know, useful to us in this time. So that's sort of the Italian Renaissance. And, uh, uh, it leads to a whole bunch of new things. It leads to art, and it leads to, to writing. It leads to the use of the vernacular. It leads to the beautifying of city-states. It leads to all kinds of things. In the North, when you go to Christian humanism, then the focus is still on learning Latin and Greek, but the focus, uh, like the reason to learn those things changes. Um, and Northern humanists, especially when you talk about Thomas More and really, you know, there are other guys, but like those are the two sort of big, big, huge people that you need to know about. Um, Erasmus and Thomas More are really want to use their humanist ideals to kind of uh, reevaluate Christianity. And so they're not going to go back and they're and, and uh, so much translate ancient Greek and Roman texts as they're going to go back and translate um, and read original versions or manuscripts of the New Testament or um, original manuscripts written by some of the early church scholars um, and try and see how that version of Christianity might differ from the version that they were experiencing. And let's face it, at the time, everybody knew that Catholicism had problems within it. Um, the question was whether people thought that the problems were like doctrinal. In other words, like, um, how's the best way to explain this? Um, whether the problems were with the faith itself or whether the, the problems were with sort of the way that the people were dealing with the faith and the way that people were carrying it out. So that's the difference. And so when you get to Christian humanists, um, they're, they're sort of going back and doing this. So Erasmus is like the great example. And Erasmus goes back and he learns, um, you know, he becomes a very good Latin and Greek scholar um, and uh, sort of foremost scholar. And he goes back and he tries to gather old manuscripts of the New Testament. And he pulls together as many old manuscripts as he possibly can. And he starts to analyze the way that they were written and the words they're using. And he, he sort of creates this, his new, his new New Testament. Um, which he writes in Greek, and it's based on these ancient manuscripts. But Erasmus being sort of, you know, a guy who wants to sell books, and he's one of the very few people who, like, at this time period, makes an entire living and gets per very wealthy actually selling books. So he translates the New Testament, and he decides that, uh, you know, he needs to make it available to, like, lots of people. So he, uh, or understandable, I mean, if people are going to read the Bible, we can't, he thinks just like put it out there and say, here are the words and you figure out what they mean. He thinks it's probably up to humanist 
dollars itself to also elaborate on what's meant in the Bible and that. So he goes through and he adds commentary and you know here's what this person meant when they said this and here's what this mean, this passage means and all of that. Um, and all this is fine and good, but uh, he's doing it or he did it I guess in sort of an attempt to reform Catholicism to try and find an older purer version of Catholicism that came before the the before like the Middle Ages and, um, and and you know make it sort of go back to its roots and along the way as he does this and publishes this and writes freely and all of that he meanwhile is like a devout Catholic he loves Catholicism he doesn't want to see anything happen to it except for to make it well that sort of changes when Martin Luther gets a hold of um, of this New Testament, he starts reading it, and in it he starts raising questions about what salvation means and where salvation comes from. And as he reads it more and more, he starts to believe that salvation doesn't come from, as the church says, um, good works and faith. It comes from just faith. And so he starts preaching this idea of faith alone as being sort of the way to get into heaven. Um, and he starts questioning lots of the practices uh, and, and sort of central beliefs of the Catholic Church, um, like those of purgatory and confession and the sale of indulgences and all of these things, and uh, kind of says, hey, you know, none of this is really supported by the Bible. So where do you go for, the, for knowledge about salvation? Well, the Bible is like the source, like that's it. So, you know, you need to go and you need to check that out. So that's sort of the long, really drawn out version of humanism. And I kind of flew into Gene's uh, uh, question here about uh, Christian humanists. So Northern or Christian humanism is using Greek and Latin in order to uh, translate biblical. It's very focused on Christian texts and ideals. And Italian uh, humanism is more about sort of trying to look at ancient ideas in order to maybe better the society around them and make it look more like, you know, the great ancient societies. Um, and those are the, so those are sort of the two main things. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that kind of answers those questions. Um, so what you get out of all of this is you get this Reformation, which is sort of what we call it today, the Protestant Reformation. It's followed by a Catholic Reformation in which Protestant thinkers or new thinkers, I guess, they were, well, they, yeah, they were Protestants. So these Protestant thinkers go out and they start rereading the Bible and they start reinterpreting what the Bible might mean outside of sort of the Catholic realm. And when they make conclusions about it that are different than what Catholicism holds, then they decide largely let's start our own religions, you know, and there are lots of reasons to do this. And there are a lot that's done, but ultimately, you know, you have all these people who are going out. Let's see, William, what were some of the causes of the Protestant Reformation's problems within the church or any other problems? Well, there's, I mean, there's lots of different things. And this is where it can get really, really confusing, okay? It's, it'd be great, nice, and easy just to say, hey, you know, the church, Catholic Church was having problems. And they were. I mean, there's no doubt. There were probably, there were practices going on which had undermined the authority of the Catholic Church. But you have to understand that, you know, many times in life, people say they're doing things for one reason, and they may also have other reasons for doing it as well, not to discount, you know, the, the religion side of it at all, but their economic reasons, their political reasons, their social reasons, there's all kinds of reasons why people not only create faiths, but also then go to those faiths. So major causes, well, long term, there's there's been sort of a long decline of the Catholic Church. Things like the Great Schism in the Middle Ages, when we had three popes that were all sort of running around saying that they were the true pope. Um, the inability of the church to deal with, uh, with the bubonic plague and to make that go away. Um, there was a lot of corruption in the Catholic Church during the Renaissance, when you have names like Medici and even worse Borgia, uh, and doing some very non-Pope-like things. 
Um, and, uh, and, and then there are all kinds of different practices going on. I mean, there were illiterate priests who couldn't read, um, and they were, they were preaching the gospel. They just sort of remembered what to say and they, you know, said the words that no one really knew what they meant anyway. And everyone sat there and said what they were supposed to say. And that was, that was your service. Um, they were, um, selling indulgences, which sort of gave salvation to people forgiveness of sins, things like that. Um, and then there was a the problem of the sale of church offices. You know, it, it wasn't, people weren't getting promoted up through the ranks from a normal, like a regular priest up to maybe being, you know, a, I don't know, a bishop and then maybe an archbishop and then a cardinal and then, you know, a pope eventually. But people were buying their way in. So these new families that had money could buy their way in for sons to become, you know, bishops, archbishops, and all of that. And they could buy multiple uh, uh, positions. So, you know, one person could be a bishop of two or three different areas, which means that they really weren't around very much. And so you have the problem of absentee bishops and archbishops who hire people to go and do the work for them. And you have some who simply hire people to do all the work for them all the time. And they just sit around and sort of have lavish uh, incomes and sit around like noblemen, but they're doing it within the church environment. So kind of all of this is going on. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you, you, you know, it sort of sets the backdrop for all of this. The humanist ideals help get the Reformation going. But of course, what really starts it all off is when Martin Luther has, you know, his big sort of moment where he nails the 95 Theses to the church door to challenge this idea of the set of the sale of, of, uh, of indulgences, because he looked at the Bible, he didn't see anything about indulgences. And they were being sold, you know, uh, for all kinds of reasons. And he kind of looked at it, here's where it gets a little bit political and economic, you know, he kind of looks at it and says, you know, what, why are the German people being asked to pay for indulgences, which is just going to send money back to Rome and back to Italy to build a really nice church for a Pope who like fights wars on horseback in armor. You know, how is that anything related to the message of Jesus, you know, who, you know, who preached peace and all of that. Um, so, you know, there's lots and lots of causes that go behind this and, uh, and, and it's just sort of question of like, which one do you choose being the, the, the biggest thing? Um, how did Machiavelli as the prince influence European leaders? I think that the prince has had an, an effect, Adam, on, on European leaders, I mean, up until the modern day, because it outlines, or for the first time, really, since classical Rome, it outlines a very secular and pragmatic approach to, to ruling. In other words, like, I don't want to say the ends justify the means, but that's basically what it is. In other words, if you have to employ things like cruelty, fear, things like that, in order to hold your people, that's okay. It's not okay in a Christian Catholic world to do that sort of thing. But Machiavelli says, if you want to be effective, if you want to have an effective control over people, sometimes you're going to have to do these things. And it's better for them to fear you than to love you. Like, ideally, they'll do both of them, but that doesn't always happen. Everyone's not that that that. Kind of you know, lucky, so boom, you know, you, you go, you go, and you and, and you'd rather be feared than loved because when times get tough, people who love you, now they're going to turn their backs on you, but people who fear you, they're going to be too afraid to. So Machiavelli um, definitely influenced uh, some of the rulers at the time. Um, you know, I mean, gosh, you start with almost you know as soon as you wrote it, and push it all the way up until the modern day and, and have Machiavellian ideas that are being thrown around as well. Um, let's see, Baron Fox. Hi, Baron Fox. Uh, let's see, every night our teacher requires, requires us to watch two or three, two to three of your videos. I'm sorry, man. That does not sound like fun. Um, maybe you could touch on the act of supremacy of 1534. All right. If we're getting into the Act of Supremacy, obviously, then we're going to be talking about the English Reformation. So 
I guess it's time to start telling the story of the English Reformation because it's very different than the others. Like re the, the Lutheran Reformation, the Calvinist Reformation, um, the, you know, even when, uh, like the Anabaptist Reformation, like, uh, like all these different things, they're based on people's interpretations of the Bible. The English Reformation is absolutely not. It's based on a divorce. It really is. Um, so the uh, so the story is the short version of the story, I guess, is that Henry the Eighth, King of England, um, was married to Catherine of Aragon, who, by the way, is the daughter of was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, and uh, you know that's all great for a long time. However, they need a son; they need an heir to the throne, especially because. Henry was the one who kind of won the throne for the Tudor family and put, you know, sort of started the dynasty and you needed to come, you needed to keep the thing going. So she wasn't having a son. And in, you know, in, that was her fault, not his. Yes, yes, we can all look now look at genetics and all of that and understand that, yes, it's, it was his fault. But I guess, I mean, fault is a tough one to throw out when you have, you know, the gender of a child, but biologically speaking, the father is the one who, who you know, determines is the wrong word, but who's who's responsible, I guess, for the gender of the child. So, uh, so anyway, he decides that he needs to, you know, start uh, looking around. And he wasn't always the most faithful guy in the world, but he and Catherine had sort of an agreement. Not one that was great, but it worked, sort of. Anyway, he meets this uh, woman named Anne Boleyn, and Anne Boleyn is, uh, you know, sort of young, whereas Catherine's not. Anne Boleyn is sort of adventurous, whereas Catherine's not. Catherine likes to pray more and more, more and more and more and more. And uh, Henry just kind of is tired of it all, and along comes this young thing, and he says, hey, you know, I want to stop the marriage. And the basis that he has for doing this is that, like, Catherine had been his brother's wife first. And when his brother died, like, you, you know, you can't marry your brother's wife. And so, he, but he wanted to do it. So he appealed to the Pope, and he basically said that the reason that, uh, that, that the, their marriage should be annulled is because you know, it was never, the marriage was never consum, uh, consummated between his brother and Catherine. And so um, the Pope says, okay, you can do the, you know, we'll, we'll annul this. And boom, he got married. And so then he just kind of wants to go back on that. And he says, wants to say, hey, you know, uh, it did consummate it. So you need to annul the marriage that I have, which would have maybe worked. Actually, usually when kings asked for things like this, popes at the time were more than happy to do it. You, you pay up enough money, and they were more than happy to make it happen. At the time, through an act of, boy, a story that's even more convoluted than the one I'm already telling, the pope was really a virtual prisoner in Rome of Charles V, who happened to be Catherine of Aragon's nephew. Pretty sure it was nephew, um, and so when the word came down that Henry VIII wanted to, you know, wanted to have this marriage annulled, wanted to divorce um, Catherine, Charles says no, you can't allow this. So the Pope says no, and so then um, Henry VIII looks around and says, "Wow, well, everybody else is starting their own religion. I'm going to start mine too." And so he proclaims himself the head of the church and puts the whole, um, the, 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 creates an Anglican church, which again, motivated possibly for religious ones. This one's a little less, you know, a little weaker on the whole religious front because it's basically Catholicism and he just puts himself at the top. But uh, he allows himself to have um, the marriage. But there's also an economic component to it and a political component. Economic because he, he dissolves all the monasteries throughout England and seizes all of their land. And then political because he gives all their land to all of the nobles who are backing him up in his um, attempts to kind of to, to maintain control of, uh, 
uh, of the English throne. And so all of this is going on at the same time. Um, and he kind of put it up and it makes for basically just this huge mess of, of, of things. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so that's the English, uh, reformation, um, age of exploration next week. Um, yeah, I'll probably be doing that either the next week or the one after. Um, it depends on sort of where we are. I'm going to be basing a lot of what I do here on where my classes are. Um, and we're just getting into the Reformation right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll definitely uh, getting on the Age of Exploration pretty soon. Why was the Council of Trent significant? Okay, so, and it's great. I love this. So uh, the, the Council of Trent's significant because you have all of these new religions that are popping up. And fundamentally, they're all questioning the church. They're saying, you know, hey, Catholics, doctrine is wrong. And they're all going back to the Bible, and they're all saying, we don't find any backing for a lot of the things that, you know, the Catholic Church is doing. And so we can't, you know, idly sit by and run off to hell. We're all, we, we need to sort of make the changes that need to be made. Well... Catholic Church realizes that this needs, like, they need to have a response to this. So they come together at the Council of Trent, and I, they, they spend a very long time, I think it's like four years they're together in the Council of Trent, trying to figure out, like, you know, how to respond to this Protestant um, uh, attack on the supremacy of the Catholic Church and the supremacy of, like, you know, one Europe, one Catholic Europe. And, uh, and so, um, I lost my train of thought here. Council of Trent. Okay. Um, and so they come together and, and they, they put together sort of a statement of like, you know, here's what we're going to do. And it's very interesting because in the Council of Trent, they decide that the Catholic Church decides that they are not going to back off of any of the beliefs of the Catholic Church. In fact, they reaffirm all of the beliefs of the Catholic Church. And they say, you know, we're right about all of this stuff. We're, we're, we're right about all the doctrine, about um, there being a, uh, a purgatory. We're, we're right about uh, all kinds of things. But we realize that there are some things that we've been doing wrong. And some behaviors have been, have gotten out of control over the centuries. And so, you know, they come down and they say, you know, you can't hold more than one church office and uh, priests have to be celibate. And, you know, they kind of fix all of the things that were, that were the basic underlying problems with the practices within the church, trying to root all, all that. But the central beliefs of the church, they say, no, we've been doing this for 1,500 years. We know they're right. You guys have been around for, what, 20 maybe so no, we're not going to have this. Um, and so they reaffirm and say, our beliefs are wrong. We need to make some changes with practices. And then number three, we're going to crack down on, you know, this, this, all this, these attempts by the devil to overtake Catholicism in Europe, um, which is sort of how they looked at Protestantism. Um, and uh, we're, we're sort of going to crack down on all of it and say, no, it ain't going to happen. So they establish a Roman Inquisition. In order to sort of root people out, they put the they put they create the Jesuit order. They put them in charge of it. They put the Jesuit order in charge of creating uh, schools throughout Europe to teach Catholicism. They send them off to the New World to go and convert as many natives uh, in the Americas as they possibly can, and uh, and then they um, they create this thing called the Index of Prohibited Books which is basically like we're now going to say there are books which you which people are not allowed to read. Um, and, you know, they throw the works of Luther in there and the works of Calvin in there. And the list grows and grows and grows eventually, you know, Copernicus, Galileo. I mean, all of it, anyone that really challenges the church on doctrine, they get their names thrown in there. So, um, that's sort of the Council of Trent. That's the significance because it's the Catholic reaction to this. Um, and it brings up one of those great what if questions. You know, what if at the Council of Trent they had um, looked a little bit more at some of the uh, doctrine and maybe said, we've maybe been 
putting forth ideas which we can't back up through scripture and maybe some of this is right would that have squelched catholicism i don't know but uh it's something you know it's an interesting question to kind of ponder over he wants to know uh martin luther and the 95 theses why is he significant well martin luther is significant simply because he's the first one of the protestant reformers he's the one who gets the whole thing going um, and what happens, what really starts off his reformation is that you have this guy, John Tetzel, who's running around Wittenberg, this small town in what is now Germany, where Luther is teaching at the, at, at the university. Um, and uh, John Tetzel is selling uh, indulgences. And he's not, you know, indulgence selling had gotten way out of hand. It had been around for a long time, the idea that you could pay money and that then that's a sacrifice and that sacrifice can you know um uh you know pay off some of the the debt of your sins like that had been around for a long time but with the need for a new rome and a new church and you know hiring guys like michelangelo to make the church the new church not only exist but also look better it cost a lot of money so they started to find new avenues for indulgences including selling indulgences for um, dead relatives, selling indulgences for future sins, selling indulgences for just about anything you could think of. Um, and Tetzel was a good salesman. So he was running around this town and he was taking money from people, you know, he was getting the really rich donors to, to give lots and lots of money for indulgences. But then he was also, I mean, even targeting, you know, people who couldn't really afford to give a whole lot of money and trying to get a bit out of them as well. And so Martin Luther, decided, you know, I'm going to do what any good theologian, any good uh, thinker at the time would do. I'm going to challenge this guy to a debate. Or we're going to debate, like, the validity of a lot of things. Well, Martin Luther tended to go, like, a little overboard a lot of times. And, you know, so he doesn't, like, challenge the church on one thing, the sale of indulgences. No, he comes up with 95 things he'd like to debate Tetzel about. And he did what people did at the time. You nail it to the door of the church, which is like the bulletin board. Um, and you put it up there and you challenge, you know, this this debate. And and the debate with Tetzel never actually happens. But the um, the uh, there are people who are students of uh, Luther's at the university. And they take it and they say, these are some real good questions that need to be answered. And the only way that they're going to be answered is if we start sort of publicizing the fact that they're questions. Well, it's been around for a few years at this point, the printing press. And so they start recopying the 95 theses. It starts getting distributed all throughout Germany and uh, it causes a big stir. Well, first of all, they're valid questions that, that could be asked and probably should be debated. Um, and number two, there are a lot of princes who own small parts of, again, well, the Holy Roman Empire, sorry, Holy Roman Empire, um, who own small parts of the Holy Roman Empire um, who really would like a little more power than they're being given by the guy who's sort of in charge of the Holy Roman Empire, that being the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, who's a Habsburg and who's also you know, related to Catherine of Aragon, and, you know, he's the king of Spain, and then he's like, man, this guy's probably the most powerful man in the world at this time. Um, and, uh, but they want a little more autonomy. So, you know what? Let's challenge him. Let's challenge the Catholic faith that underlies his power, and that will give us a basis to be able to challenge his power over the, the Holy Roman Empire. So there's a little bit of that going on as well. So that's why Luther is significant. But he's also significant because when it comes down to it, and when he's called in front of sort of this, this imperial diet, the, the meeting of the Holy Roman Empire, pretty much, um, and uh, he's called in front of them to recant his beliefs. Like Charles V says, you got to just like step back and say, it, I take it all back. He says, I can't. And out of that and out of his new interpretation of what the New Testament says comes the first Protestant religion, which is Lutheranism, 
Lutheranism. Um, and you, you can see Lutheran churches around the United States today um, that, you know, sort of they're, they're, they're doing the Luther thing as, as it goes back. The impact of the Reformation on colonization and exploration. Well, it had a huge impact on colonization and exploration because, you know, you have the you have this attempt to try and spread Catholicism and or and spread Protestant religions. I mean, they were both out there trying to spread it, um, natives and things like that. Um, and really, like there was this sort of religious war for the souls of these native people, and it was being waged on native soil between Protestants and Catholics who both ended up doing some pretty nasty things to natives in the name of religion, because if they didn't convert, they were pagans, and thus they were going to hell anyway, so it doesn't matter what you do to them, I guess. It's really kind of, it shouldn't be that flip about it but you know what I'm saying and so both sides really do some pretty bad things to uh, to the people in the name of religion I guess is that you know the the explorers under Hernan Cortez who come to what is now Mexico City and then they see you know people's hearts being torn out from their bodies and them being their bodies being thrown down these large uh, this large temple, you know, they're going like, yeah, no, we got to get, we, we got to get Catholic Catholicism going here. Um, so when you look at it, like, I mean, of the Protestant Reformation become very huge and they end up in a lot of bloodshed. They end up in a lot of controversy and they end up tearing apart the one thing that had that's up through the Renaissance, really, which is Catholicism. Um, and it sort of tore that all apart and threw it to all the winds. And now people are fighting over religions and there are, there's all kinds of chaos that goes on as a result of the uh, uh, this Reformation. In the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate end of all of this, you have what we have today, which is a varied interpretation of Christian belief, um, where Catholics, Protestants, um, you know, they peaceably coexist, but they look at different uh, ways to interpret how to get to heaven. Um, and uh, depending on who you talk to, depending on how fundamentalist they are, um, they may believe that people of other faiths not necessarily like non-Christian faiths, but like Catholics would, some Catholics would say this about Protestants, some Protestants would say this about Catholics, some Protestants would say this about other Protestants, like they're not going to heaven because they don't get the right message out of all of this. So, um, so there's that sort of long lasting debate that's been a part of this as well. Excuse me for a second while I take a little drink of water here. So really what you have is you have a reformation that challenges the Catholic Church and that says, hey, you know, um, we're going to make some serious changes here because we don't believe that, that A, what you're doing is right and B, what you're saying and the way you're interpreting things is right. And we don't want to be misled by a church that doesn't have things right. That's really kind of the Protestant Reformation in a nutshell. Um, and uh, and its implications kind of move through the centuries. So, yeah, that's kind of the big thing. Um, so, if anyone... Ah, social impact of the Reformation. I was just about to get... I was just about to call an end to this, Gene. I'm starting to lose my voice here. Um, okay, social impact. There's a lot of them. There's an increased uh, like like value that's placed on uh, family members. The family is tighter as a result of the Reformation because there's this there, there's this real need to raise your kids in the right way. Um, women actually almost take a step back because what had been an option for unmarried women, which was to go into the into uh, a, a convent. 
like become a nun, like that goes away in many areas of Europe. So they don't have that. They don't have really any viable option outside of marriage in order to sort of maintain, I don't know, a, a livelihood for themselves. Um, so there's that social impact as well. And in a deeper sense, it also sets the stage for a more democratic system of government, you might say. There's there's a long-term kind of effect that leads to the ideas of the Enlightenment, especially in ideas of democracy and questioning the rule of kings, because if any person can read the Bible, and if any person can have their own relationship with God, and if, as Luther says, can be a priest, really, a preacher, then why can't people govern themselves? And why can't people run their own country? And why are we listening to this king who says that he's been appointed by God when we don't believe that? There's uh, huge social impacts on uh, the Reformation as well. So um, I know I've only been going for about a half an hour, but, uh, but I'm starting to lose my voice already. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, call an, a little bit of an early end to this week's session. But uh, but please pass this on, and we'll we'll do this again next Tuesday night. Um, probably talk a little bit about religious wars, um, and uh, and maybe get a little bit into exploration as well. Um, and we can of course review anything that uh, that we've done in the past. You know, as we get closer and closer to probably your first big test that you know covers really a big chunk of material um, and especially as we go like cascading towards the end of the first of four periods in AP Euro which ends in 1648 so um, you know we'll be sort of gearing up for big tests I'm sure all around the country right around the same time until next week I'm Paul Sargent thank you for watching and Please subscribe to my channel, tell people about my channel, and uh, you know, check out the videos there. And if there are videos that you know you really think something needs to explain, be explained, drop me a note, and I will be more than happy to uh, to try and pull together uh, some more videos and, and get this stuff out there to kind of help you guys out. Um, you can also visit my webpage. There's the uh, there's the the address there. Um, and that gives, I mean, you can have access to sort of the way I teach the class, I guess. So for better or for worse, it's all out there and it's all free just for you. So have yourselves a great night and, um, and, uh, let's see, significant artists. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can definitely talk significant artists in the near future. So, all right. Well, Hey, everybody have a great night and thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Tell your friends. Later.